Hi, Eric. <clears throat> Andrew. We'll just give it a, another minute or two before we get going. Okay, I think, I think we can get going. Um, just first, a uh, quick little piece of uh, housekeeping. Um, the BBSR is going to not put on seminars in July and August, just for the summer. So we'll be back in September and you should be receiving your standard school medicine emails um, when that seminar starts back up. Um, hopefully we won't have the registration process, but maybe we will. Um, so we'll deal with that together. Um, so today uh, we're going to hear from Eric Clamby, who is, uh, amongst other things, the director of the flow cytometry shared resource at the Cancer Center. Um, so he's going to be talking about best practices in mass cytometry analysis experiments. Um, Eric, do you have a preference for how you take questions? Like, like at the end, or you want people to interrupt, or... Uh, I'm happy to take questions at any time, Andrew. Um, yeah, yeah, yep, happy to handle it however works best. Okay. Um, I think, let's see, I, I think people can unmute themselves. So if you can, you can, you can interrupt, or if you end up not being able to, just, just go ahead and throw the question in chat. Um, Andrew, uh, do you want to mention the survey now? real quick before we get going? Um, yeah, we're, we'll just throw a, a survey about the, uh, the seminar series as a whole in the chat. 
if you could take the time to respond to it at your convenience, um, just to help give us insight into potential areas to explore for uh, talks in the future. Okay. Eric, you want to take it away? Sounds great. Uh, Andrew, does that come across? Yep. Okay, perfect. We just see the uh, presenter mode. Okay. So, or, or just the slides themselves. Just the slides. Okay, good. Right. Great. Uh, well, uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity to, to speak, and um, thank you for attending. So, my name is Eric Clamby. I'm the director of the Felicitometry Shared Resource. Uh, that's one of the hats I wear. And uh, today, I'd like to talk about best practices in felicitometry and mass cytometry based research. And I'm going to try to uh, cover a range of, top of topics. Um, uh, really to, uh, in, the, in an effort to try to increase the, the level of sophistication and uh, rigor and reproducibility that what people are getting in their cytometry based studies. So uh, the real goal here is how you can get the most out of your cytometry based research while avoiding common mistakes. And I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So um, I am happy to take questions throughout or by email afterwards. I also would like to point out that um, the Flow Cytometry Shared Resource in the Cancer Center, um, uh, our resource is constantly thinking and dedicated to flow cytometry and mass cytometry based research. Um, and we offer a variety of different services as well as education and one-on-one -on -one training. And so um, certainly uh, additional questions that come up, um, not only myself, but uh, the staff of the Flow Cytometry Shared Resource are wonderful, wonderful uh, for, for providing insight on how to do the best cytometry you can. Okay, so, uh, so flow cytometry and mass cytometry are two complementary technologies. Um, they both enable the rapid quantitation of cells and their properties. And uh, these methods, uh, t you start with typically with cells that are in suspension. So these, these, these methods both require the cells have been dissociated and the cells are in single cell suspension that the, you can't have clumps uh, when you analyze uh, samples by uh, these methods. Uh, so one cornerstone is cells in single cell suspension in fluid phase. Then you have your various detection regions that can include antibodies, which are kind of the workhorse for these technologies. But there are other uh, detection regions which can be used. And then ultimately, flow cytometry is uh, quantifying the fluorescence, um, of the cell associated fluorescence. So in this case, for example, there are two different fluorescently labeled antibodies that with different uh, light properties. Um, and it, and these antibodies can bind to proteins expressed in this cell. Uh, so flow cytometry is quantifying fluorescence. In contrast, mass cytometry, or CYTOF, uh, is quantifying uh, uh, isotopic mass. And so in this case, antibodies are not conjugated to, fluorescent, to fluorophores, but are instead um, coupled with isotopic, uh, with isotopic elements. Um, and so for example, typical experiments will, will measure isotopic mass between 89 to 209 uh, for mass range. Okay, so why, why are these uh, techniques uh, powerful and of use to a wide, a wide audience? So let's start with a very simple example. And in this case, we want to, comp uh, we want to compare uh, how cancer cells respond uh, either untreated or in response to a cytotoxic agent. And from this cartoon, I think you, can, you probably can get a sense that in the control group, the cells are fairly uniform, but in this uh, treated uh, cohort, there are a number of um, uh, different responses indicated by different colors. Okay? And so with flow and mass, uh, flow and mass cytometry, um, what's possible is to analyze uh, this population of cells with single cell resolution to really understand how different cells are behaving within this population. Some 
standard measurements that can be incorporated with these methods include the analysis of cell death or and division or proliferation. Uh, frequently, analysis is focused on changes in protein and in RNA expression, uh, as well as the induction of reporter genes. And so, this method, these methods are allowing you to quantify what's happening in that population of cells with single cell resolution. So, when you start this, you could, you could imagine you just want to quantify how many cells are undergoing cell death. So, for example, in this top example, uh, when it's drug treated, you might want to say, how, how vulnerable are these cancer cells to this, uh, to this chemotherapy? And what you'll note here is that while many cells uh, die, indicated by this uh, darker color here, there are some cells which survive, right? And so um, by, by quantifying the homogeneity or heterogeneity of the, the, the response, um, this already tells you that in this case, the current uh, drug treatment is not going to be sufficient to completely eradicate these cancer cells. So that's uh, analyzing uh, typically like one, par one parameter, but the real power of photometry and mass cytometry comes by, through the simultaneous measurement of multiple parameters with, uh, across hundreds of thousands of cells. And so for instance, in this, in this bottom case, uh, in this study, there were multiple detection radiants um, capable of detecting different proteins, okay, the red protein and the purple protein. As well as, as well as two different types of phosphorylation events here in yellow and here in purple, and then also induction of a reporter gene. And by integrating multiple measurements um, with single cell resolution, we're able to see, for example, that in the cell that encodes a reporter gene, for example, looking at a stress response, that these cells that undergoing the stress response only induce this purple protein. In contrast, these uh, cells that are not inducing the stress response are inducing uh, multiple proteins, as well as a distinct phosphorylation event, which is not observed here. And then you can imagine that uh, apoptotic cells might exhibit a, a distinct phosphorylation signature, possibly indicative that of the underlying mechanisms that drive cell death. And so it's really uh, the analysis of multiple parameters across hundreds of thousands to millions of cells that affords the unique insights that both cytometry and mass cytometry can afford. Yeah. So as I mentioned, they can, uh, these, these technologies can uh, measure a, a variety of different, respond, uh, different parameters from protein and RNA expression to basic cell processes, including cell cycle, uh, signal transduction, but they're also frequently used to assess cell function and cell types. So for example, if you want to look at what cell types are present in a person's um, blood, after, after a virus infection, flow cytometry or mass cytometry are standard methods to uh, define those cell types. As I mentioned, this is a multi these, these can be multi-dimensional multi uh, uh, techniques, um, which really allow uh, one to define interrelationships between parameters within a cell, uh, as well as understand the heterogeneity or homogeneity uh, in cell responses. Um, these instruments can measure hundreds of thousands of cells per second, and so often these, these data sets involve thousands and millions of events. They, these assays are typically dependent upon antibodies. And so if you have an antibody of interest to a protein or a process, you likely can leverage and make use of these technologies. But also note that um, antibodies are critical for rigor and reproducibility. So if you have a bad antibody, um, you can really be led astray. And then if you haven't used these, these methods before, you might ask, well, what are the resulting data? Uh, the resulting data are single cell quantitation of cell associated label, and whether that's uh, fluorescent uh, signatures for different antibodies um, or, ice, or isotopic mass, um, and typically they're, they're in an FCS uh, file format, uh, and there's a variety of different softwares for the analysis of these data. So if you look really broadly, the, the five broad steps of uh, these types of studies First, you begin, begin with experimental design, then sample collection and processing, acquisition on the machine, and then ultimately data analysis. So that looks pretty straightforward. But then if you start uh, digging deeper into each of these processes, there are some really important uh, devils in the details. Um, for any robust uh, cytometry-based research, you really uh, want to have uh, careful experimental design, including what experimental com comparisons you care about, 
Um, you want to define and reduce the variables, um, particularly in batch effects, and I'll talk about that uh, later. Um, you want to make sure that you have um, well-behaved antibodies and uh, an optimized sample processing. Um, and this is all to reduce uh, technical artifacts. So in terms of sample collection, there are various kinds of tissue that can be subjected to these me methods. So for example, peripheral blood, that's very, very easy. The cells are already in suspension as single cells. But often these methods are used to study tumors or uh, cell lines where uh, these cells need to be uh, disaggregated before they can be um, processed and analyzed. In terms of sample processing, you require uh, cells need to be dissociated, subjected to various treatments, and then uh, antibody stained. And then in terms of in the instruments, uh, these, there are a variety of different instruments that can be used, um, but it's very important to make sure that they have, uh, that they are maintained to high standards, um, that you know the instrument settings, and that during the collection, you need, a, uh, you need to have many controls in order to appropriately interpret your data. And then for data analysis, there are a number of uh, quality control and uh, uh, post-collection processing steps that are required before you get into either uh, manual or algorithm-based analyses. Um, but please remember, these instruments are exquisite at detecting uh, whatever you put in. And so if you have poor sample quality, um, these, these instruments will return data to you, but it might ultimately be garbage. Okay. So as I mentioned, the cells uh, for these uh, studies, cells need to be in single cell suspension. Um, and uh, you'll need, for example, for flow symmetry, you'll need fluorescent labeled antibodies or other probes. Um, and you'll need standardized uh, sample collection and controls. Um, one thing that um, I, we often end up seeing um, in experiments is that, um, that, there aren't, that not all the controls have been collected that are required to appropriately interpret your data. And so, one thing that I would it's really important for best practices, um, whether it's, whether it's uh, flow dimensional flow cytometry or another kind of flow cytometry, special flow cytometry, is it is essential to have uh, controls to understand the behavior of each of your individual fluorophores. Um, and without these controls, it's often imp impossible to accurately interpret your flow cytometry data. Okay. So here are some things that you should think about that may or may not uh, apply to you, but um, certainly can be um, spots to trip people up. So first, um, because these technologies require cells in suspension, not all cells tolerate dissociation uh, into a single cell um, suspension. Uh, furthermore, if you're using tissue such as tumor tissue, the processing, uh, the enzymatic and mechanical uh, processing that are required to get cells dissociated, to get a tumor dissociated, for example, um, can result in uh, can affect proteins that you might be seeking to measure, uh, but they can also affect what cells um, survive and ultimately go through the instrument. So here you need to choose your dissociation reg regions carefully, and um, whenever possible, you want to quantify what impact these enzymes have on protein expression before your big experiments. For the machines, um, if you're using a core facility such as ours, um, Standard, pro uh, standard practice is daily quality control. Um, and so machines should be routinely calibrated. Um, but, but please note that the even the exact same machine between two different days may have slight variation. And in terms hey, of, yes, please. Yep. Uh, quick question on the machine calibration. Is there calibrating like over time within an experiment? So if you're, you know, reading through a million cells or something. Yeah. Um, so there are controls over time? Um, right, so it depends on the, the technology. So for mass cytometry or CITOF, there are um, equilibri equilibration beads which are spiked into the sample. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, basically one of the post-processing steps is normalization of that signal um, over time. Um, for the flow cytometers, degradation of uh, detection signal isn't as, as much of a problem um, within a run. But if, you want, if you're trying to compare like across days, it's best practice to have some internal standard that's been subjected to the exact same treatments um, to, to understand if there is any drift, drift from the day to day. Okay. 
Thanks. Oh, one one uh, more yeah. question. Christine, yeah, you want to say? <laughs> yeah. So we have um, some beads called Flow Set Throws that we do run on some of our instruments daily to make sure that we don't have that drift. And we do provide those for experiments if people would like to run them with every experiment so they can track that drift themselves. Thanks. Thanks, Christine. Uh, so Christine is one of our one of our senior uh, members of the Flow Corps, uh, and she's an amazing resource. Uh, okay, uh, right. And so uh, additional things uh, to consider when you are getting into flow cytometry um, are what antibodies you want to use and what fluorophores you want to use. Um, and uh, that's going to be influenced by um, uh, various things, including what's available and what, what the machines are capable of measuring. I'll get into that a little bit. So for flow cytometry, this, re this relies on fluorescence detection. Um, but one challenge is with this technology is that uh, fluorescence is uh, that you have spectral over overlap between different fluorophores. So here is an example of, in the top row here, fluorophore is excited by a uh, 488 nanometer laser. Okay? And you'll see uh, a range of, and this is uh, wavelengths on the x-axis, and you'll see that uh, for example, different like different fluorophores have uh, a broad emission spectra that can overlap with neighboring fluorophores. So here, for example, this uh, this green Fitzy uh, peak can uh, has an emission profile that overlaps partially with this PE signature. Okay. And so, one of the important things um, that is required to appropriately analyze flusometry data is to appropriately uh, consider and um, compensate for spectral overlap. Okay. And so if you're using a conventional flow cytometer, that's, that, process, that signal correction is called compensation. There is a more recent technology called spectral flow cytometry. And with that method, uh, the machine actually collects a, the entire uh, emission spectra of, of an individual fluorophore. Um, but there also is signal correction required there called spectral unmixing. Okay. So historically, conventional flow cytometers, which are still uh, frequently used uh, and a gold standard in the field, have, uh, have been equipped with multiple lasers um, that excite different fluorophores and multiple detectors that collect discrete emission wavelengths. So on the right-hand panel here is a, a figure from uh, a useful reference from the Hertzenberg group in which they show uh, for each row, it's a different uh, fluorescent molecule. And then it's showing the excitation spectrum, uh, and that's this red line here, and then the emission spectrum, and then this blue line. And then in this gray box indicates where, the, where a flow cytometer is actually collecting the emission wavelength and assigning it to this individual fluorophore. Okay. So for example, in the fluorescein here, um, you can see that this molecule has an emission spectra um, in blue. And this kind of tail over here is not being collected and ascribed to the fluorescein uh, signature. In contrast, the PE uh, fluorophore has an emission spe spectra like this. Um, but you can, you can imagine that if you had uh, an antibody, one antibody same with, fluoresc uh, same with fluoresc fluorescein, another with PE, that if you're not careful, this tail from the fluorescein fluorophore could basically be inappropriately ascribed to the PE fluorophore. And so we'll talk about this, but um, critical to this is the use of compensation. And the way you deal with that is you collect uh, samples that have been in individually stained with each of your individual antibodies so that you understand the fluorescent fingerprint for each individual fluorophore before you start mixing them together. Right. Um, yes, okay. And someone just asked um, if I can comment more on resolution limitations with fluorophores. Okay. All right. Uh, yes. So I will talk about, I'll touch base on that in a little bit, and I'm happy to, to talk about that further if I don't answer your question. So, um, okay. So, um, uh, so a bedrock of flow cytometry is the use of fluorescently labeled antibodies. Okay. Now there are a wide variety of fluorophores um, and just some examples are indicated on the right here. 
But please note that fluorophores differ in their brightness, their stability, and their excitation and emission spectra. Okay. And so, for example, um, you can have an antibody. This is a case where there's one antibody with one defined specificity, and they've conjugated it to all these different fluorescent molecules. And here you can see that in this top row, this brilliant violet 421, there is profound res resolution between your positive and your negative population, right? But if you go down the list here, um, you can see that there are some uh, fluorescent molecules which afford a much uh, poorer resolution between your positive and negative populations. Okay? And so as you get into flotometry and want to do uh, mul and want to have multiple measures, one of the critical things is to really to think carefully about panel design. And what, what we mean by panel design is choosing carefully so that the fluorophores are paired based on, their, on the relative expression of their protein targets, and that the fluorophores, uh, the fluorophores you're using will, will play well together. Meaning, for example, that you, know, you wouldn't want to use, you wouldn't want to, all of your antibodies to be uh, excited off of this the 488 nanometer laser and all uh, focused here. Instead, the goal is to try to disperse the, the fluorescent molecules you're detecting across multiple lasers that for different excitation and also uh, different detectors to really minimize if as much as possible the amount of spectral overlap between neighboring fluorophores. Excuse me. Um, yes, in this diagram, can you um, discuss a little further how you get your negative population? Is that if you are detecting off of two measures or gates? Um, right. So, um, so typically, uh, right. So, um, typically you're going, you're going to have your single stain control where you have your, um, your cell. So you'll have your, un, your completely unstained sample. Okay. And then your and then you'll have your single stain, um, which will, which will allow you to see your, your positive and negative. Um, ultimately, if you want, um, to have confidence in terms of the fluorescent signature, um, you're um, including additional controls, and that can be, for example, having a sample where your protein of interest is not expressed at all. For example, having a target cell in which it's a, a knockout of your protein target. Um, other mechanisms can include the full minus one control, in which basically you have your panel of you might have two or three of antibodies, and then you you and you think you have a fluorescent signal, and you think you have this positive signal. And then uh, to give you more confidence about that, what you can do is you can remove you can remove this antibody, and if you remove that antibody and that population completely disappears, then you can ascribe that that population to that uh, that antibody. Um, so the full minus one is definitely a standard approach that I would recommend um, whenever you're concerned about interpreting what your positive and, and negative populations are. Thank you very much. Okay, so another part of uh, panel design is not only which fluorophores you're using, but also um, trying to pair um, your, your detection regions with the relative uh, expression level. So for instance, if proteins are expressed at a low level, um, you, you want to use bright fluorophores that will provide the optimal detection of the target. And commercially, if proteins are expressed at high levels, you can, uh, you can use antibodies uh, conjugated to weaker fluorophores. What you wouldn't want to do is, uh, is if you're measuring a your very abundant protein, you would not want to use the brightest four or four possible because essentially you are maxing out the, the signal um, and you're very likely to get spectral bleed into neighboring channels. Um, and we have documentation and uh, our staff um, frequently think and talk about panel design. So um, please uh, feel free to, to reach out to us on that. It's also worth noting that um, as, as is true for antibodies, regardless of your application, whether it's Western blot or flow cytometry, your antibodies need to be titrated to, to achieve the optimal signal to noise ratio. Uh, if you have too much antibody, um, you can have an increased background signal and more fluorescent spillover into, into neighboring channels. And if you have too little antibody, you have suboptimal differentiation between your positives and negatives. And so uh, as you're setting up your, your experiments, uh, we would advise always to titrate your antibodies to identify this optimal um, um, 
background, uh, background signal to noise ratio uh, for each individual antibody. When you are considering uh, using an acetometer, there are multiple, things, multiple parameters that you should be aware of. So first, uh, you need to think about what, what lasers that, that instrument has. So lasers excite fluorophores. And so remember, different, different lasers require to excite different fluorophores. And the more laser, lasers you have, the more potential fluorophores that can be excited. Okay. Then, uh, and our instruments have between three to five lasers. Instruments also have detectors to detect fluorophore emission. The more detectors, the more fluorophores that can be detected. But please note that, um, that there might be cases in which you don't want to max out the number of lasers and the number of detectors, um, because the more detectors, the more you can also have signal spread as well. So um, there is kind of a sweet spot. It's also important to note that all cytometers require continued maintenance and quality control. Uh, and uh, and uh, for example, in a, in a flow core, uh, we have uh, daily quality control metrics, um, but also um, you need to be sure that you are bringing personally the appropriate controls for your signal correction for your individual experiment. So there are uh, tens, if not hundreds, of different cytometers that have been developed and are commercially available. Um, I'm just going to give examples from our facility. And so uh, we have uh, conventional flow cytometers, um, and so these range from three to five laser versions and can measure uh, from 12 up to 28 parameters. We have a, a spectral flow cytometer, which is uh, the SciTech Aurora. This is a five laser machine. And, the, and while both the conventional flow cytometry and spectral flow cytometry, they both use fluorescent, they both detect fluorescent molecules. They both require cells that are in suspension. But uh, what's important here is that the conventional flow cytometry relies on compensation to uh, account for spectral spillover because these machines are collecting a very uh, narrow range of emission for each individual fluorescent molecule. In contrast, the spectral flow cytometer in this technology collects a much, uh, essentially collects a fingerprint of fluorescence across the entire uh, emission spectrum. Um, but here, uh, the primary way of, of accounting for signal correction is the use of spectral mixing. In both cases, for both compensation and spectral mixing, so regardless of, of which technology you're using here, it is critical for you to have single stain controls so that you can, you can accurately define the fluorescence from each individual fluorophore so that you can then understand what, what fluorescence signal you're getting when you're mixing all of your antibodies together in, a, in your experimental sample of interest. So for the uh, mass atometer or CYTOF, this, uh, we have a Helios and that can collect uh, more than 35 parameters. And here, um, there is less of an issue in terms of um, uh, channel bleed over because it's, this machine's measuring mass rather than light. Um, but there is an important time dependent normalization that's required for uh, signal correction with CYTOF. Now, this might be obvious, but it, um, I think that this is something to really keep in mind uh, as you're bringing your samples to the cytometer and then analyzing the results at the end. It's really important to understand what you're measuring and what you aren't measuring. And what I mean, mean by that is um, really considering the, the manipulation steps required to get the samples into the machine. So here, for example, is a tumor. Uh, well, actually, that, this is a granuloma. Um, you, you have to mechanically and enzymatically dissociate that. And even in this process, you'll note that there are some cells which might apoptose due to the dissociation treatment. Um, you then need to filter them. Uh, so then you end by stain, and then you filter, filter them. Um, so you you're ending up with uh, an antibody stain cocktail. Um, but you also have debris. Um, you have some, some cell doublets, which might make it through a cell filter. But um, are basically a technical artifact. And then this mix of material, this mix of cells and single cell suspension is put into the machine. So uh, for data analysis, you want to focus the analysis on uh, based on cell size and cells and scatter. For CYTOF, there's a slightly different parameter that it's used, and I'm happy to discuss that later. 
You then want to remove doublets. You want to remove dead cells. The reason you want to remove dead cells is dead cells often bind to antibodies in unpredictable ways that are likely to give you technical artifacts. And then you'll characterize cells based on their frequency or, uh, or their antibody fluorescence. But the point I'd, I'd like to drive home here is that if, uh, that there is sample dropout that occurs uh, during this processing. And that doesn't mean that these technologies are not very informative, but it simply means that you should be aware. Um, and if, for example, you're doing experiments and, and you are not finding a cell population of interest, it might be worth uh, really significantly reevaluating your sample processing to make sure that you are not disproportionately introducing sample bias. Okay. So what does uh, flow cytometry data look like? Well, here's just an, an example. Um, so this is, uh, on these plots, each individual dot is in, represents an individual cell. And so but in flow cytometry, there's a parameter called forward scatter, which is cell size and side scatter, which is this is scattering um, or granularity. And so each individual dot on this plot indicates a different cell. And then typically uh, analysis will involve sequential gating of events. So for example, here, uh, this lymphocyte population can be, then be focused for further analysis and then analyzed for different parameters on the X and Y axis. And then the uh, an additional gate can be applied here and then analyzed in the sub subsequent population. And so what you're starting with is you have 100% of the cells and then you're, consequent, you're cons uh, continuing to winnow down the analysis to focus on more refined subsets of cells. And so uh, often you'll hear the term uh, gating. Um, and this is an example of biaxial or Boolean gating. So for example, cells are defined as X and Y, but uh, not Z um, at, based on their cell phen to phenotype cells. So uh, now I'd like to talk a little bit about compensation and data display because they can really influence how you're interpreting your data. Um, and, I, and there's a great primer um, that is still uh, completely relevant today, um, indicated in the slide, if you want to investigate this uh, subject further. So here's an example of uh, uh, flow symmetry plots. Okay, so in the top row, this is uncompensated data. And the only thing that these cells have been stained with is an antibody that should be showing up in the, in the green channel, okay? Um, but if you look, um, if you compare the top row, this uncompensated, um, you'll see that there's this, posi this double, double positive population, okay? So these cells appear to be both green and yellow positive, despite the fact that the only thing that they've been stained with is the green antibody, okay? Now, what compensation does is um, it defines the amount of uh, bleed into the neighboring channels, and then it introduces uh, calculation to offset that bleed into neighboring channels. And so what compensated data looks like, and again, this has only been stained with one, with one antibody, the green antibody or the FITSI. What compensated data looks like is rather than giving an artifact of dual positivity, there's a, a signal correction. So now these cells are only positive for one parameter. Okay. So, uh, okay, right. So compensation is critical. Because you can imagine, if you didn't have compensation, the, and you didn't know that the sample was only stained with the green antibody, you would falsely interpret that these events, that these cells here, co-expressed um, proteins that were detected by both the green and the yellow antibodies. Okay. So another important thing to appreciate is data display, and that can profoundly influence your interpretation. So, for example, in this uh, bottom left plot. Uh, the data are compensated, but you can see that there's a, a large number of, of events which are smashed against the axis. Um, in contrast, there are now, in most photometry software uh, programs, there are ways to display the data to make sure that you are seeing the complete spread of data and not being misled by events that are buried on the axis. Now, another thing that wor that's worth noting is that in this case, in the, in the bottom right plot, these data are correctly compensated. Okay? They've only been seen with one antibody, um, this FITSI antibody. Um, but if you look at the spread from top to bottom, 
between the positive population and the negative population, there is, despite the fact that it's correctly compensated, there is a wider spread. Okay? And that's an important thing to consider in panel design is uh, how much spillover there is, even, uh, pardon me, even in a correctly compensated sample. All right. So uh, another thing that's worth uh, discussing is um, how, for example, when you're drawing gates, how do you know where to put a gate? And so, as I alluded to earlier, it's, it's, if you want to have uh, high confidence in the populations that you're defining, uh, there's significant value in having multiple controls. So here's an example where um, we had uh, uh, the actual experimental comparison was this untreated versus this TPA stimulated uh, sample. And uh, in this analysis, when there was no probe added, and so here it focus on the x-axis and the shift there, there um, versus this, uh, these samples that were, it was, it was the exact same cell line, but it was not virus infected, but it was stimulated. Um, and then we have our untreated, virally infected untreated cells and our virally infected uh, stimulated cells. But you can see here that, um, you know, depending on which, uh, which samples you run or do not run, you know, that influences where you're going to draw those gates. So for example, in the case of the no probe, uh, if, if we'd only run this, then we would have likely sent the left-hand side of this, uh, of this intermediate gate. But instead, by using this uh, matched cell line that's stimulated, um, we have higher confidence in terms of defining this intermediate population relative to um, our TPA-stimulated virus infected samples. Where that's the only samples that have, should have that signal. Okay, so there are a number of things that can um, can lead you lead you astray in uh, in your flow cytometry and mass cytometry data. And so, what you want to want to ensure is that you are ruling out artifacts. You want to you want to rule out dead cells and doublets. Also. Uh, Sometimes there are, are issues with fluidics. For example, if you have a, a sample that has lots of, of clumps in it, it might clog the machine, um, or there might be fluidic issues. And so one thing you can do is look at as a function of time to ensure that you have stable signal over time. You also want to make sure that you appropriately account for signal bleed over. Um, and that includes including single stain controls to understand the fluorescence property of the individual stains. Um, as well as full minus one uh, stains that allow you to have further confidence about the uh, antibody giving you the correct the signal that you anticipate. Okay, so um, right. So one last note in terms of controls. So uh, there are uh, negative controls to define background, background fluorescence can include knockout cells. That's a great uh, specificity control for an antibody to make sure that your antibody isn't cross-reacting against something else. The full minus one uh, is the case where you include all your antibodies except for you drop out one specific antibody. And that allows you to define the fluorescent signal coming from all the other, other antibodies. And that's, and that's important because remember, these fluorophores can, can bleed into neighboring channels and um, can, can give you artifacts in that way. Now, Sometimes people uh, will make use of an ice type control, uh, which is the an antibody with the same ice type but a different specificity. And these are typically commercially produced um, to not bind to anything. Um, but please note there are some caveats to ice type controls. And if you use an ice type control, be sure that it's matched, like with the same company, the same floor for, um, because uh, sometimes people will interpret that the population is negative based on the ice type control, but please note these have been selected to have minimal binding. And so in general, I would, I would recommend, I would always recommend an FMO if you're concerned about interpreting, interpreting. And certainly if you want to layer on an ice type control in addition, but I think that the FMO is uh, very robust for defining uh, fluorescent, uh, fluorescence. So when you, when you publish your data, when you go to publish your data uh, for photometry, I think it's also very important to uh, define, to carefully define what you are showing, right? For photometry data, you can gate on, on various populations. And so 
For figures, you need to define which cells were analyzed. And typically, it's uh, smart to include a complete gating strategy that, that can demonstrate to the reviewer or the reader um, how you identified your cells, how you executed doublets and dead cells. And that, that also will allow you to uh, show how you define your positive and negative populations. And that would often be complemented by inclusion of an FMO control where there would be minimal fluorescence for that, param for that parameter in the FMO control and robust signal in your positively staining samples. One other thing I'd say is please don't show, just show numbers. Um, I think there, there are lots of cases in which seeing the primary data can be extremely informative. And it's also, it can be very easy to mislead, um, to mislead readers by just showing frequencies, for example. So let's talk, let's turn towards uh, mass cytometry or cytop. Okay. So this is cytometry by time of flight. Same principle as flow cytometry. The cells are in suspension. They're also stain, often stained with antibodies. But the difference is that the antibodies are not fluorescently labeled. They're labeled with isotopically purified rare earth elements. Um, now, given that you don't need to worry about spectral bleed over, um, Cytoff is able to measure at least 40 parameters uh, or prot proteins at the single cell level. And so this is really a high dimensional uh, platform. Okay, so, uh, right. So remember that uh, when you look at that, periodic table of elements, that each element is actually, there are a variety of different isotopic masses for each element, right? So here, for example, this is showing that uh, there's European 151 and 153. But it's possible to get these isotopically purified elements and then, um, and then use, the, use these to label antibodies. And so that's the principle of CYTOF, is isotopically mass labeled antibodies. Now, uh, CYTOF is an incredibly powerful tech, uh, technique and extremely exciting. Um, it, uh, one of the, it, but it raises some interesting challenges with the high dimensional nature of the data, right? So if you're looking at 35 or 40 dimensions of data versus uh, five or 10, um, you have some additional challenges. Um, you also need to, uh, to think about uh, go to great lengths to reduce technical artifacts in your CYTOF data. And the reason I say that is that a lot of the high dimensional data analysis algorithms that you use for CYTOF analysis can be uh, very sensitive to technical artifacts. Okay? So if you are getting into CYTOF, I would strong, please talk to me or please talk to us. Um, we love to talk about this stuff. Um, optimal experimental design should include efforts uh, to limit batch effects and artifacts. That includes a standardized sample processing, the use of uh, isotope-based barcoding um, to mitigate uh, to, and in this case, you have, for example, 10 samples, each is assigned its own unique barcode, and the samples are then pooled together and then subjected to antibody staining and collection. The reason that, that barcoding is, is of value is that you, rather than staining 10 independent tubes with an antibody cocktail and then having 10 independent tubes go through the machine, a barcoded sample is processed as one, as one bolus of cells. And then afterwards, the data are debarcoded or deconvoluted um, to allow, but using barcoding allows you to have a single antibody stain and processing and a single uh, instrument collection, removing two sources of variation. Uh, if you're comparing between runs, I also would strongly urge you to include internal standards and refer reference populations to make sure that you understand the performance of that, of uh, the, the stability of the instrument and your antibody cocktail over time. And this might sound uh, trivial, but please uh, consider what you're, you're trying to analyze and sufficiently power your study. I mean, I think that these CYTOF especially is incredibly powerful, but uh, you need to understand the variability uh, biologically that you're trying to, trying to interrogate and make sure that it's powered enough that you can uh, ultimately end up with uh, a robust uh, conclusion. Okay. So for data analysis um, and uh, for CYTOF data, there are a number of, of steps you are, that are required. First, you need to normalize the beads. 
um, which corrects for time dependent changes in signal detection. Then you need to de debar code if, if applicable. You, uh, in some cases, you might uh, try to cor correct for signal sp spillover. This is less common in CyTOF, but, um, uh, but it can be done. You then need to subject the samples to pre-processing quality control metrics. In CyTOF, there are a number of Gaussian parameters that can be used to, uh, to clean up your data. And then ultimately, you want to identify your nucleated events that bind to iridium, which is a, an intercalator. Uh, that are viable. And for Cytoth, you actually use cisplatin as a live dead discriminator, where dead cells uptake cisplatin and live cells have very limited, very low cisplatin levels. Uh, so here's a couple examples that, that I've encountered of artifacts that can happen in Cytoth analysis. Uh, so one example is uh, anticipated issues with sample collection, where, there, uh, where as you look over time, um, there might be an abnormal signal, and that's true even after data normalization, which, uh, uh, and in that case, then you want to think about the stability of your, of your sample over time and the stability of the instrument as, as well. Uh, it's also possible to get uh, aberrant events. Um, uh, sometimes people, when they analyze the data, so the samples that are run for CETOF include these equilibration beads that are used for standardization. But, um, if, but those are beads. And so sometimes if you aren't aware that those beads are in there or, or forget that they're in there, and then you subject your, your sample, your, your data to further analysis, you, you can actually be misled because these isotopically labeled beads can um, look like there might be an interesting population until you realize that it's, it's simply that internal standard for sample normalization. And so as a general practice, I, I like to remove beads or at least um, to very purposely identify them in, in the analysis so that I'm not misled by them. Okay. So I mentioned already Boolean or biaxial gating. That is one approach that you can use for, for any cytometry based, based data set. Um, and certainly it's a gold standard for defining leukocyte subsets where there are mutually exclusive markers. But when you think about that for CyTOF analysis, uh, that's extraordinarily labor intensive um, and will not allow you to discover new populations. And so uh, the field of data analysis for CyTOF has really turned towards, um, towards more powerful uh, algorithms. Uh, there are two basic principles that many of these algorithms use, um, and those are dimensional reduction and clustering. And, op and often uh, these two modalities are combined together to visualize your data. Now please note that sometimes uh, you might only have, some algorithms might only do afford dimensional reduction or clustering, but um, I would generally recommend using algorithms that uh, afford this integration of uh, dimensional reduction and clustering. Now it's also worth noting that different algorithms will show different levels of resolution. Uh, and Here's an example of that. And so here we took one common data set analyzed across 10 different algorithms. Um, and in each of these algorithms, we've colored by based on CD45 expression. Okay. And so here, for example, you might hear of Visney or Tisney. And I note that depending on which version of Tisney, there are different versions of Tisney. Okay. And so uh, you, um, you want to be aware of which version you're using and if it's optimal for the number of events that you're trying to look at. Recently, there's been a new version of TISNI called OPSNI that's been developed, which has been uh, optimized to analyze larger data sets. But if you, if you look across all of these, you know, these, it's the exact same data set, and yet the, the visualization and how you interpret it is very different. Right? And so in the top row, um, each dot here is an individual cell. In the bottom row, these algorithms are focused on uh, or, or portray cluster level information. Okay? And so uh, one thing I would encourage you to do is as you're considering different algorithms to really understand what the data are showing you um, and the strengths and weaknesses of, of the method that you choose. Um, there are a number of parameters that can influence uh, the data, uh, data analysis. Uh, 
uh, and what you're seeing at the end. Uh, these include uh, what cells you're putting into these algorithms. You know, are you putting in all cells or all viable cells? Or, for example, your pre some preselected population. Some algorithms will tolerate a large number of cells, others will not. Um, and then for clustering uh, algorithms, you need to think about what, parameter, what parameters you're using for clustering. Are you using all parameters or are you only using a selected subset of parameters? Um, please note that as you're going through and uh, seeking to use high dimensional uh, analysis algorithms, and this is true for either CyTOF or for spectral photometry using the CyTEC Aurora, that as you get into these algorithms, these algorithms are very sensitive to, to changes in your, in your settings. And so as you're doing this, um, you want to keep exquisite notes in terms of the input population, uh, the parameter settings, so that ultimately um, you can keep track of uh, what, what was the basis of your data analysis. One example of how uh, your input population can really change your interpretation. Here we have an example where we were looking at how many CD4 T cell clusters there were in our data. Um, and so when we used an input analysis of live nucleated events, um, this analysis identified five of the 29 clusters that, that were characterized by robust CD4 expression. So based on that, you'd say, well, there are five clusters of CD4 T cells in this, in this sample. But instead, when we took a pre-selected, we, we purposely pre-selected CD4 T cells and then subjected them to the exact same algorithm. And this is the phenograph algorithm. And they had now identified 16 clusters. And so what's the right answer? Well, I, I'd say it really depends on what level of resolution you want to, want to obtain. If you said, well, how many, uh, it, it, and it's kind of whether it's a 10,000 foot view or a 100 foot view or a 10 foot view of the forest in terms of how uh, the level of resolution that you're obtaining here. Um, you also- Eric, I've got a quick question there. When you do that um, subset analysis, do you include the marker for the T cells when you do the 16 clusters there, the second version? Right, yeah, great point. Yes, so generally um, I, we, we do not include as clustering parameters any parameter that we've used to select those populations. So uh, in, this, in the case, so that's a good point. Um, I can, uh, I don't have it here, but I, I can tell you that um, that uh, changing if we uh, that that's not the reason why you're getting the different number of clusters. Um, uh, but yes, uh, yeah. So for example, in this case, we get it on C3 positive, C4 positive T cells. So we did not use those two parameters for the the clustering analysis. Okay, thanks. Um, right. So uh, and then please be. Uh, very cognizant that the number of clusters that you get is really influenced by your cell number, right? And so here's just an example where this is an early study where we had done where we ran, went from 2,000 up to 20,000 cells uh, per sample. We had uh, 10 samples. And then, but you can see that the number of defined clusters went from 20 to greater than 40 clusters identified. And so uh, the one reason I mention this is if you're if you're comparing different experimental groups, you know a healthy versus disease state, you want to be sure that you are not getting artifacts just because, for example, the disease state has tenfold fewer cells. Right? You want to standardize the number of input cells for your experimental con condition to to rule out that as a basis of artifacts. Okay, so. Um, I would be happy to discuss at length after this different algorithms, but one thing I'd say is, you know, whatever, there, there isn't a single magic algorithm, and what you need to know as you begin to use those is you need to understand the performance of that in terms of what parameters are influencing the visualization, um, how re reproducible or variable the, the output is, and then ultimately, you want to be able to corroborate your findings using a complementary approach. So for example, if you use a high dimensional analysis approach, you want to, and you identify a really interesting cell type, you want to be able to, for example, by Boolean gating, you want to find that exact same population back to make sure it's not an artifact of the uh, algorithm. Okay. So I've covered a lot of, of ground today. 
but um, just taking a, a step back here, in terms of getting the most out of your flow, set flow cytometry or mass cytometry based research, um, the first thing I'd say is do not underestimate the value of a strong experimental design and really optimizing uh, your things that might seem trivial but can have a, a profound impact on your, on your data interpretation. That includes standardized sample processing, use of well calibrated equipment, um, optimized antibody, uh, antibody panels, and controls which are essential to obtain meaningful data. When you're publishing your data, you need to be transparent in how you analyze them and what cell types, what, what cell populations were, were analyzed and how they were analyzed. And please, be, please note that data analysis and visualization can heavily influence your interpretation. I would strongly advise you consider multiple ways of visualizing the data and do not rely on a single algorithm um, or a single output um, as the basis of your paper. Uh, okay. And then someone asked about my experiences with plugin versions of, right. So some of the uh, analysis algorithms that I mentioned um, now have plugins with a conventional, with a standard full time tree software program called Flojo. Um, so um, one major advantage uh, with using that is that um, it doesn't require that you do much coding, um, whereas a lot of the other Often, if you want to go outside of the Flojo based plugin, then you have to, to do things in R or Python. Um, I'd say that uh, it's kind of, uh, I've, just had, uh, I've just had variable experiences. And so I'd, I'd say um, it's, it's definitely worth trying, uh, trying things in Flojo if you're comfortable with Flojo. Um, and I think that oftentimes it meets the needs. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, right. Okay. So um, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to, I know it's time. I'm happy to take questions now or by email. And our core is always happy to, to answer questions as well. Thank you for that presentation, Eric. That was great. Um, yeah. Does anyone else have any other questions? I have a question, Eric. Thank you for the talk. Uh, you beautifully described a lot of internal and external controls you use in running the machinery. Yep. Do those results go into the data analysis process or is that kind of an external monitoring to tell you that the machine isn't or is working? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Dan, typically that's just kind of for our records uh, in, in the flow core. Um, you know, ultimately if, if an investigator need, uh, want, wants or needs that, that information, we can provide that to them. Um, but it's, it's not something that is typically uh, incorporated into any individual's ex experiment. Yeah. Thank you. Um, oh yeah, and then I, I have some links here as well um, that uh, for various, some video tutorials, and then um, a couple of exam examples, including a recent paper, uh, an issue of cytometry that really is focused on rigor and re reproducibility. Um, yeah, and I, I wanted to mention, um, we'll be posting this talk on YouTube. Um, when I can find it, I'll drop in the Cancer Center's YouTube channel. Great. Well, uh, again, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or to the flow core. Um, we are happy to help however we can. Um, and we want to make sure to empower your research. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Eric.